Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Bradley and I am the Programs Manager here at Ulight Arts. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for Homestyle, an intimate conversation with artists set in their homes. Tonight we will be joined by five artists from our current exhibition, Idioms and Taxonomies, which was curated by Ulight's Director of Programming, Laura Marsh, who is here with me. Now more than ever, communication and language are really our only means of connection. This exhibition, which features the work of our 15 resident artists, touches on language in a multitude of ways. Not only as a dialect, but notions of language can be found in the process, material, and mentalities behind the works. Before we get going, I want to encourage everyone to grab a drink, sit back, and relax. Make yourselves at home. Submit any questions you have through the chat. We'll be selecting and reading out questions throughout the conversation this evening. I'm going to hand it over to Laura, who will give us an introduction to the exhibition and how it came to be. Hi, thank you for joining us tonight. And I just want to basically thank our artists. We have 15 really dedicated artists. Their works unfold in the studio. And when you curate a show like this with 15 set artists, really the, the thing that comes to mind is going into their studios and trying to find common themes. So I found that through this process, I was able to visit with every artist before we started working from home, which I know has shifted all of your practices. And like Amanda said, the way that we communicate and how we even layer our works to deal with diverse topics. And I found that I was in these beautiful conversations with familial um, ties and cultural narratives. And a few things that we talked about were um, ways to create space in your work to allow the viewer to enter the narrative. Also ways to pause with artwork. And, and also I talked with artists about their cousins, their brothers, grandfathers, and cultural icons. So there was a lot of layering going on in the studios. And a lot of the artists are directly dealing with language. And two of the artists that we've brought here tonight, Nabila and Philip, have phrases in their work. And I really want to start there. And this process of classifying cultural symbols and references and layering them with your own personal dialogues and families have really um, provided this nice conversation for the show for Idioms and Taxonomies. Well, let's bring in the artists and have them introduce themselves. We'll give you all a little glimpse of what their works are in the show. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Floridor. I am a Haitian American artist born and raised in Miami, Florida. A lot of my work has to do with my family relations and my memories from my family and just family history. Hi, everyone. My name is Felice Groden. It's great to be here. Um, I would say my practice within the last few years really explores uh, the transiting between uh, digital and analog space. Uh, in addition to that, I'm part of a collective uh, collaboration called AST. Hi, everybody. My name is Adrienne Rose Gianta. I'm an artist, uh, curator, cultural producer. Um, from Brooklyn, New York originally, and living and working here in South Florida now. Um, generally, my work deals with creating environments um, through video, text, and or uh, other objects that allow the viewer to uh, enter into possibly another world. It's wonderful to be here, and thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, my name is Philip Karp. I'm an artist, photographer, and archivist. Um, I was born in New York City and I'm currently based here in Miami, Florida. Hi, my name is Nabila Soraya Santa Cristo. I am from Ponce, Puerto Rico, and I am a painter that works with political subject matter. First, I thought it was an appropriate um, point to start with the elephant in the room, which is we are in a really unusual time. Being an artist and thinking about a virtual exhibition is really daunting. Um, can any of you give us a little bit of insight into how your experience has been making work, participating in shows with all that's going on? I think for me personally, my practice has 
shifted from moving from painting into more digital work because since I work from home, I have to have a small device. I work on my iPad on my laptop. So just finding ways to make work in a smaller scale and or plan work for the future to be made, I'd say. I think um, I've kind of, well, one, I've always kind of worked in small spaces and especially in my house. So I feel just um, kind of buckled down at home and started like continuing to make work. Um, and I feel like it's just kind of isolated me a little bit more. I don't know if that's a good thing. I'm normally like that. Um, but it's kind of nice doing stuff like this because it kind of allows you to interact with people, even though I'm a teacher and I'm so done with Zoom. But um, it's really great to kind of talk to other people at their work and kind of like um, put the show together and kind of this sort of continuing as normal a little bit, um, especially in the art side, which is really nice. Police, did you want to touch on it? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I think all of us, in a way, are, are really having to reevaluate. You know, what our practices uh, not necessarily are about, but how do they how do they perform? How do they do? How do we do this? Um, and for me, because I was sort of all, always interested in the digital realm, um, I'm still struggling with it, and, and particularly this sort of idea of intimacy, um, something we've spoken about kind of behind the scenes is how do we, you know, create experiences together um, with, with, with these sort of constraints? And I, I think um, it's probably, I would imagine for a lot of artists out there, just a very, very prominent question within our practice right now. I also think with your work, it was great because um, the work both have in the show is from this like digital platform. And then um, all of a sudden you, for the show before we like went into quarantine, um, we had planned that, or you had planned that it was going to be in this space and you created this like room and you had the projection and the television. And then now it's like back to this 2D like digital platform. So it's kind of like interesting that now we're seeing your work in this way again. Yeah, it's kind of come full circle in the sense that you, you know, you, you made it within a screen and then it kind of existed in the three dimensional world. But now it's, it's kind of existing again behind that screen, even though a new element of reality has come into it. What, what we get to, you know, experience is just a fragment of that virtual experience. Yeah, I happen yeah, to be one of those. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Ahead, <laughs> no, I, I sure. I um, I was one of the few people that have actually seen this, uh, or Felice, the show really as a full and Felice and Adrian's um, installation, and the experience of seeing it in person versus seeing a digital representation of that, whether it be through photos or images, um, video format. It's interesting to see how they translate um, on both accounts. Philip, I want to ask you a little bit about where you took that image, the friendly image, like where it was on location. And then also like your relationship to the word friendly, how you felt about it before COVID and then afterward. Like, how do you feel about friend, the word friendly now? Sure. Um, uh, you know, I was driving with my camera as I often do. And I remember seeing this green uh, building out of the corner of my eye as I was driving. So I ended up turning around and making a U-turn and coming back. And when I parked, I realized that there's this giant hand-painted sign on the facade um, that said friendly. Um, and I thought that this was really interesting. And I was questioning how this establishment relates to this word and why they would choose to place this so large and bold on the face. Um, of this structure. Um, you know, the word friendly, if 
by definition is uh, kind and not harmful, but it definitely isn't always a good thing. I mean, you could be too friendly. Um, Can you be friendly today behind a mask and six feet apart and with all of these physical restraints? You know, I don't recognize anybody with masks on. I've, I've had a hard time standing near people I know and they're like, say their name to me. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize, you know, who it was. Um, but I, I absolutely think we can be friendly and we absolutely should be to an extent. Um, in this time, I think we're in, in need of care. Uh, absolutely, uh, f being too friendly could be, uh, you know, s a sign of like, apathetic or sometimes it doesn't seem genuine um, but I think that there's absolutely a place for it I think yeah, I Philip, it's, sorry, sorry. <laughs> go Adrian go <laughs> I think it's really interesting the way in which Philip decided to print this uh, friendly, you know, on the on the form versus a traditional photographic surface and framing it, you know, it's printed lar almost larger than life. And, you know, in the image, we see the structure coming towards us. And then it's on a wall that, you know, is concaved as well, too. So can you talk a little bit about the relationship there and some of those decisions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm definitely interested in the relationship between the way that photographs are perceived and how we view photographs. Um, I'm interested in the display and, and the presentation and, you know, printing this image on, on vinyl, it almost becomes part of the architecture of the building itself. Um, it doesn't separate itself with a, uh, a physical frame. Like, yes, it is an object. It is a piece of vinyl that's affixed to this gallery, but having it presented as a, um, as a vinyl uh, adhesive, um, I thought displayed that. Um, it also kind of mirrors this idea that, you know, you're photographing a structure, but essentially the image itself kind of morphs with the structure of the gallery itself. So kind of a play on what is being seen, what's being understood, and then how is that relating back in person? Um, I thought that was really interesting too about the scale and the, the final placement of the work for that specific piece. Um, I wanted to jump to Nabila. Um, you your painting actually also does have an idiom within it. And I wanted you to give us a little bit of insight into how your process kind of positions itself as a conversation. Um, if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, hey. Um, so I've always, like in this work, I use typography specifically, like that idiom, let sleeping dogs lie. Um, and always really been interested in typography within painting. Um, specifically, in my older work, I was doing like a lot of political subject matter, kind of was specific to myself. So I was making work about like feminism. And um, like, I guess, in academia, um, the lack of like female representation that was being kind of shown to me. And um, I used typography with work as a way to kind of discuss like my feelings towards that and how it felt to like be a female in this art world and like dealing with that lack of representation because all all my art like family was men so I would kind of hold this conversation this sort of like um like how do I feel about this oh this feels like kind of crap or like um, all even it, when I'm kind of talking to my students about work like abstract expressionists a lot of those people are men the sort of back work that was happening in the painting with this work and like what's happening now politically I felt like um, I was really upset with like the current administration and sort of the stuff that was happening and that I was seeing and I just felt like a lot of rage and anger and I wanted to make work about that but um it didn't affect me directly like a lot of the feminist issues 
they were affecting me directly. Whereas like, you know, treatment of people um, at the border and the breaking up of families didn't quite affect me personally. Like my family um, immigrated, um, but we didn't have that um, sort of treatment. So um, I thought that to genuinely speak about a subject like that, I had to use language that was sort of removed and idioms, which I've always had issues with, um, either Spanish idioms, which I love, which I was introduced to by my mom and that she uses all the time, but I don't feel uh, comfortable using or, or English idioms because our first language was Spanish and to English idioms, you have to have like a firm grasp of the language and I don't feel like I have that. So I felt like um, idioms was a really great way because it was language that's removed. It can be applied to something that's not very specific. Um, and it can be applied to something that, or to multiple different things. And you can apply this language to different scenarios. So I thought that was like a great way to show like my position on these subjects sort of as like moved. Um, and then with this, sorry, I'm talk a lot <laughs> with this piece specifically like let sleeping dogs lie I wanted to sort of discuss like um, families being separated at the border and like just the the treatment of them and the way that the administration was kind of saying like how dare you like question this this is like the solution to this problem that by doing this we will like have less people coming into this country make them like not want to come here. Uh, and like how dare you guys sort of question this you know all of us kind of knew that it was morally wrong so they kind of had this feeling of like just let this happen that you questioning it will make this worse and that's why i chose that idiom to describe that yeah i, I feel like that work um, you know, when I, I, my first experience with all of the works in this show, you know, was in install. So I didn't necessarily know any of you and, and your history as an artist, but when I looked at that work, it, it felt really approachable. And I think the way you use your practice to talk about difficult things and make them approachable and kind of dissect them into this like playful banter within materials and color and texture is really nice. Um, I really enjoyed that. And, and I have gotten to know a few of your other works and I, I'm interested in the way that your practice and process really plays with conversations between yourself and politics and everything that's happening in the world today. Thanks. Yeah, I had another comment about um, Nabila when we talked a little bit yesterday about sleeping, let sleeping dogs lie. Um, you're actually, it's an old English phrase, so it goes really far back in history. And then as we talked more, it seems like your paintings are a channel, like you open up a channel and then I think about other idioms like sweep it under the rug or don't stir the pot, you know, and I, I think that your work really opens up this this larger sort of a problem even of, of how we tend to sort of not want to disturb um, prominent thinking, you know, and, and and I'm wondering like how how you see those paintings taking on layered meanings and if other meanings come out of them. Um, yeah, so like I think as I'm like making the work, um, I feel like I, well, when I'm telling you, it's all like out of rage, um, like being upset. <laughs> oh! um, and I feel oh. like when I first start the work, um, I use like a lot of abstract language because in, like within painting and the history of painting and especially what I'm doing now, I don't feel like painting is really a solution to these issues. So like I can talk about people coming into this country and being separated at the border and these families being ripped apart. But like, I think a news article or like a video of that or an image of that is more like um, important or impactful. Sorry. Um, so I feel like um, 
for me, when I began, or that feeling kind of frees me to not make a didactic image. So I don't have to make like an actual image of like a family or a child being ripped apart from their mother and father. I can kind of use abstract language um, or like non symbols and objects to kind of create some sort of magic and like coaxing of these like revolving ideas that keep going in my head. Um, so, and then at the end, like idioms, well, one, like I don't have a very strong tie to it. I use the idioms because one, I, I've never felt comfortable. And I kind of try and figure out this all encompassing like sense that will, that will kind of speak to this. Um, and I'm trying to more point out like the absurdity of like, I don't know, all these like things that have been coming up politically. It just feels like this, we're at this weird time where it's like Harry Potter world. Like we know what's bad and we still have people like kind of deciding that we're gonna do these like terrible things and other people that are kind of saying like, I don't know, that are kind of justifying it in a way. Um, and I, I wanted to make work more that absurdity and idioms is like a great way to kind of talk about amplification of like these hard issues. Yeah, thanks. I want to segue to talk to Adrian and, and Felice who have collaborated on a video. And, um, I know both of your works individually, and I know that you've collaborated a few times before. And Felice, I, I've, I'm used to looking at your, your 3D models and your 3D printed objects. And Adrian, a lot of your works deal with the body politic and feminism. And I think it's interesting that um, you both struck a balance with this work. And I'd like for you to talk a little bit about how it was developed virtually, because it seems the practice really for this piece you did remotely. So Adrian, maybe you can start. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, one, it's been amazing to work with Felice. And uh, the day I met her, she came into uh, grad school uh, when I was in grad school. And I met her then. And from that day on, uh, she's been an amazing person to know. And we've spent a lot of time having conversations about exactly what it is that we have created together and have been working towards creating together. Um, and it's interesting in this particular installation that we've created together, you know, obviously conceiving it with the idea that people would actually be able to enter the physical space that we've created and have an experience. Um, and of course we conceived that before COVID occurred and we can't be together in the space as we normally would be. So um, normally I'm okay with that because my practice is a little bit more computer-based and internal in a lot of ways. Um, but I do like to create these environments that people get to inhabit and become a part of and have a different sort of experience. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, in this particular collaboration, uh, I think we almost switched roles a little bit more so it, from our usual practice where I'm usually concerned with the figure um, in the space. Actually, Felice is the one that's created the central figures for the installation, um, these hybrid creatures that are free of bodily form and space. They could be big, fat, skinny. It doesn't really matter about their gender or um, any of that in this particular space. I more so in this particular collaboration was concerned with the space and the sound and the text um, associated with it. So it was a really nice kind of exchange and change for uh, learning how to work differently and, or not completely differently, but um, free myself from the body and feminist issues. <laughs> Please. How about for you? 
how do I follow that up? <laughs> it's a great, great lead. And um, yeah, I mean, Adrian and I just have this amazing fluid relationship. I mean, uh, we've always been interested in interactions that are as much, um, you know, online or so forth and so on um, as they are offline and uh, and how how one can circulate as an entity um, outside the physical body and have those experiences and how those experiences uh, resonate as much as they do um, in the physical. So it's more like a, a, I don't know, a physiological kind of ex experiment, if you would, right, where there's still a sort of sens sensory uh, engagement. You know, I don't think we're interested in a kind of technocratic concept of, of what we're doing. I think it's actually quite the opposite. Um, and I mean, these hybrids, I, there are these sort of forms that I created actually, to be honest, for Instagram stories. <laughs> I was just playing around. And I think, Laura, you came in and just saw what I, you know, what I was doing. And I was speaking to you about my work with Adrian, and we just sort of put it together. Um, but we've always worked that way. So, you know, it was a great opportunity that Ulay gave us to, to continue that relationship. But it is a very curious thing that, you know, that, you know, we're still now questioning chicken and egg as far as localizing uh, an artwork in an actual, you know, space uh, versus not. And, and again, for me, this isn't a result question, right, yet. Um, but it would be interesting to do like a part two to this, maybe a reversal in a sense, you know, that it, 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 it is something that would exist on purpose, not localized in, in, at Ulight in particular in that actual space. But in this case, it is. And Adrian and I have actually not been to the space. We've not been there. So we've actually not experienced it. Yeah, and that's been an interesting experience, I'm sure, for both of us because Elise as an architect and myself, uh, you know, when I curate and design exhibitions and or even an installation, respond to space um, so strongly that, you know, it's strange to be completely removed from the space and instruct others on our behalf on, you know, paint color. I mean, the paint color, I guess, is the easier part, but you know, putting a vinyl and how the projection should be and having a FaceTime conversation to check audio, <laughs> which was really hard to do, especially when, you know, you create a lot of time creating, you know, a symphony in a sense, um, and you are not even sure how it's going to sound until you're physically in the space, but we had to rely on the eyes, the ears, and the hands of the Ulay team, which actually was quite exciting and adventurous. And from what we hear of the people who have experienced that they have actually had this physiological response in the space that we were hoping for. Yeah, I think, um, I think the way in which your work kind of came about and that it went up was really interesting. Um, one, because I was one of the people who got to experience it from beginning to end, but also thinking about the artist process and how much extra preparation and information you have to give someone to make a work on your behalf, not knowing that you can't, you know, walk into the room, hear it, see it, feel it. Um, and I think, at least from my perspective of working with you all on, on building out that space, it was crazy to see how much detail and um, information you shared with us in order to make that piece what, at least from my response, I believe is what you were going for. Um, so it's it's interesting how this time has kind of shifted the way we produce work and we produce like the preparation of work that may not be something that we can um, physically install ourselves as well. Yeah, also same here, Adrian. I was not actually physically in the show. I haven't stepped foot in there yet. And that for me as an, an artist who curates was such a strange feeling because I always look forward to install. So like working with Amanda and Sharice Crockett on the details of the show felt very foreign to me in some ways. Um, and then having a, you know, my personal life, having a baby and, and kind of realizing that shows evolve over time. I felt very lucky that I was able to meet with all of you in the studios before we started working from home. It just to have that personal connection to be able to choose and write about the work was really helpful. But then the way the show evolved 
it shifted so much works changed um, perspectives changed and we all have been like riding out this moment together and then mark i was wondering if you could kind of bring us back into the domestic space of home style and and talk to us a little bit about your two pieces that which are very much about family space and home space and um you represent your grandfather in a work and he wears these really interesting croc like shoes and then the piece in the show um on the second floor channel 45 time and the wheel miss Gritil, um which we talked about castor oil playing a big role in your family history and you being from miami if you could talk to us a little bit about the role of family and and how that shapes your your quilting process yeah i say that for my work the role of family has really influenced my work because i think a lot about family and my past and how it's affected my present or will affect my future i sit in one of the piece the piece saturday massage channel 45 time and Moon masky too it's a image it's imagery of my parents bedroom from my viewpoint so they're looking at me entering their room but the interesting thing about the artwork is that there are people like the people in the artwork are in different time spans so my mom in the piece is it my mom from currently or my dad from the past or my oldest sister from the past and kind of collaging moments of in time into one piece and a lot of my pieces are collages in that sense and i don't remember the what was the original question um, so the question is just how that role of family plays yeah. into work and, and also yeah, how does it relate to textiles yeah textiles on my mom's my mother's a seamstress and i've seen her sew a lot or help me fix my pants for school and just how textile is very forgiving i'd say i love working with textile printing on fabric i have an example of a piece behind of me where i'm printing on textiles or even dyeing fabrics and using textile for either puppetry or for quilting or for gluing fabrics back to a painting I think that I love finding finding fond materials and then recreating the materials to better use to better use for my artwork. Can you um, talk a little bit about what your process is? I know you mentioned now you're working a lot more digitally, but I know you have a really interesting process. And can you share a little bit about what that looks like when you're creating your quilted works? Yeah, my process it changes mattering on the piece, but I would usually, for now, I'm working digitally through either on my computer or through my iPad on, on Procreate. And then I make the digital piece until it, I feel like it's fleshed out. And then I would print it out through a company, Spoonflower. And then I would either quilt it or dye the fabric. And then it'll be a finished piece. But it's just a really long time span from making the digital work and then printing it on fabric and then quilting on top of it and yeah, also dyeing the fabric yeah, yeah you're i was kind of fascinated by your work um you know i spent some time looking at it and walking by it and i was like how how does he do this um because i couldn't tell if it was traditional like traditionally quilted and you quilted an image into it if it was found fabric and as I've learned more about it, I think it's really interesting because, you know, textile and quilting has such a rich history and you've kind of created your own language by starting with a digital drawing and printing on fabric and then taking it back to a physical tactile work and then sewing on top of it and adding that extra layer, um, similar to how you're rebuilding and reconstructing these memories of your family and your past through different times and these different motifs that are in the work. Um, we do have a question from the audience if, uh, for Adrian and Felice, you may know more about this than I do because I don't speak tech. Uh, do Adrian and Felice start to use chance in the future if there is ever a time after COVID? Um, chance, I think, is a program. 
where you make a system, but others may install the work. No idea what that is. <laughs> That's a very specific question. From Ben <laughs> but it's an interesting one. Because um, I was just thinking like a chance operation, you know, and in some ways it is, I guess, to a certain extent, but I, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Um, but I think that instead of the word chance, I mean, I'd be interested in that actually if it's a, I'm not sure if it's a software or some kind of protocol, but um, I think the idea actually that projects are um, not necessarily uh, individualized so much as, as they've traditionally become known, you know, it's a very kind of traditional, I think, standpoint. Maybe because I studied architecture and I have that in my background, I'm really used to, uh, you know, collaborations and working with people and um, knowing that you don't have full control of the outcome really of anything. You know, so I, I welcome that. I, I think it only adds to it and um, it helps to engage, you know, with other people and, and you build relationships that way. And it's not to say that the outcome isn't important. Of course it is. But um, I, I think I would say that most people I've, I've met through Ulight, you know, we all kind of share this idea that we never know exactly what, what's going to happen, you know, within our practices. But I, I, I am interested in involving, you know, more people than, than not. And that's just my own personal you, Adrian. I mean, I'm not sure what the program is, if that's a specific program, but I think we really didn't have a preconceived idea about how we were going to collaborate together. Um, and every, every step along the way feels like you're taking a chance when you can't physically be together in the same space. Um, you know, at first we started out working on this together in Felice's studio at Ulay, and we were actually troubleshooting together side by side and figuring things along the way. And then it had to be, you know, phone conversations, Zoom meetings, and just, you know, taking chances to, I mean, we took a chance on the whole installation, not even knowing what it was going to turn out to be like because we couldn't be there um, and I I think I just love the idea too that Felice has mentioned and you know the chance of meeting I think the whole idea of being in Ulay and in the studio um, is the chance meeting of people who are also in the same space place and time as you that you wind up having a conversation with and saying hey you know we should work together or try creating something together and I think you know now that you can't physically do that maybe these are perhaps the ways in which we find opportunities for chance so that we can say hey Nabula I really like you know what you're doing over there and how do we you know work together let's have our own little zoom chat um i know i've also been obsessed with mark's process in his quilt work as well too and you know philip i know pretty well so i know what's going on there <laughs> and i love and appreciate philip and his three cameras that he carries around with him on the daily when he's out and about um so I think I I kind of might obsessively be stalking some <laughs> some of you all from the internet, in in chance hopes that maybe uh, some other interesting ideas will surface from that as well too. So, you know, how do we how do we have chance in these situations? This, this seems to be the way, possibly. Philip, I had a question for you before I go to another question from the audience. Um, so. A big part of being a photographer and working in image making, a lot of the language uh, that that you construct comes out of organizing images and the relationship you have to those images. I know now um, you may not be going out as often to shoot, but have you spent some more time with older images? What's your process? I know you mentioned you consider yourself an archivist, so I'm sure you definitely have a process as to how you develop your own photographic language. Sure. Definitely. I'm, I'm always collecting images, whether I photograph them or pull archive from the internet, uh, scan images from books. And, you know, I'm not necessarily looking to um, literally create documents of specific places or time, but more so to use the images at a later date 
um, to talk about or question other ideas that I'm working with. Um, so a lot of the images that I use in either one project or singular doesn't necessarily have to be from one particular moment or, or time uh, that I had taken them. Um, you know, and um, many of us are taught early in life to, to read and write, but we're not often taught how to look at photographs or interpret images. Um, you know, if you have the privilege of owning a phone, many of them contain cameras. So most of us are able to take photographs in our daily life. So what is the difference between photographs that you can make on your own or a six-year-old with their parents' phone or me? Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in what it is to make images now in a world that is so saturated, um, especially now that we're in this sort of um, strange space where we're uh, most of us not going out as much. I know I haven't been. So taking photographs is normally in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I've been doing a lot more research and, and reanalyzing uh, my past archive of images. I know I use the word images and photographs sort of uh, interchangeably sometimes, but yeah, no worries. you got to deal with that. Um, so I have a question for Philip, Mark, and Nabila from Michelle. Considering the current state of affairs and the nature of your works requiring the unperson experience, do you imagine that your work will change as the quarantine progresses? Yeah, I can continue. I guess what I was saying before is, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm, well, I guess going back in the beginning of everything being shut down, um, I was not going out as much or at all. I was staying in my home. And uh, I wasn't actually taking photographs during that time, uh, maybe for two months. So reanalyzing old work, um, doing a lot of research, writing. I've been writing a lot um, to sort of gather my thoughts and figure out where my practice can go from here um, and the way that I can use the images that I have uh, to expand on that. I say for me, my works, um, physically, my works has changed a lot since quarantine. I was before quarantine, I was making large scale paintings and now it's become more digital and more on the fiber side because it's a lot less messy. And so like if my nieces or nephews come here, they won't be that much of a mess or an anxiety with the paint, but the idea of my family or works on my family is still constant because I'm home with family all day. So I take a lot of photographs of them or document random moments of things happening in the house. Um, I feel like for me, I've just been like going down the rabbit hole a lot. Um, just because there's so much happening <laughs> and I feel like there's um, a lot of like raw emotion that I have to like kind of sift through. Um, I know my mom gets like terrified every time she sees the news she's like oh my god I hope my daughter like doesn't check Twitter or something um, because I just um, feel like you would think like at this time that things would be like <laughs> quieter because people would be like isolating at home but I feel like um like all these issues that have been like problem for a very long time have kind of like boiled to the surface and um yeah and I feel like I don't know it's just like seeping a lot into my work to a point now where I feel like it's kind of difficult to like I usually make a lot of paintings at the same time I know Mark does that too like he does a lot of work at the same time. And like right now, I just feel like so overwhelmed with the amount of paintings that I wanna like make. I just feel like, oh, I need to like talk about this. Or like, oh, I'm angry about this. I need to like make a work about this. Um, so yeah, and I feel like I've just been sitting here like waiting to vote. So <laughs> I'm just ready. I don't know. I'm just been sitting at home for way too long. So. Um, and I watch a lot of cat videos to kind of take me away from all of that. So yeah, that's pretty uh, much it. I have another question from the audience from Kara, which I guess we can pose to all of you. Is adaptability a key component of creativity or is that personal to each artist in relation to their work or more specifically to their practice? 
So how do you guys feel about that? I'm used to adaptability because I work with technology all the time and shit happens. <laughs> you know, the audio fails, the video doesn't work, the projector dies, all of that kind of stuff. So I think, I don't know if it's because of tech that it works. You know, I, I'm always kind of used to that. But, um, and even after I finished school and I realized I didn't have a studio anymore, I kind of turned to my computer and decided to work with everything within it because I didn't know what to do with all the stuff that I had built and created before. I didn't have the space for it anymore. So I'm more adaptable as, a, as my artist self than I am as my human self in daily life and work. Um, I totally agree with that too, because I feel like for me in my personal life, I have to have like a lot of structure, you know, and it's hard for me. I have a lot of anxiety about things kind of changing, but art wise, like um, when I first did painting, I was making like very large scale paintings. And then as we like moved to New York and to like different places, our apartments got smaller and smaller and smaller. So our piece and our work would kind of get smaller too. Um, I also think just like all artists sort of adapt, like not just in the way that they're creating work, depending on their environment, but also like subject matter wise. Like, I feel like the way that I was using um, typography in the early work in comparison to the way that I'm using typography now, where I was super blunt in the beginning and like, is what my work is about and now I'm being like super coded and using like coded language um, to kind of show like my distance so I feel like you just naturally kind of progress in your art practice um and that's like normal like everyone does that Philip I have a question for you um in a world from Daniel in a world where photographs can affect reality at a huge ecological psychological and socio socioeconomic scales how can people become more photographically literate give us the sources there's lots <laughs> wow i mean i think it's um it comes from really looking and 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 taking a deep dive into what we're we're, we're viewing um, you know, images are, are made to translate, or at least they're present to translate into um, many different meanings. And, and, you know, we bring into our, our viewership our own experiences and our, and our own, um, you know, our own weight uh, of how we were raised, where we come from, our identity. Um, so that plays a lot, you know, as an as a, as a artist with my own work, um, I, I'm weary of guiding someone too directly towards um, what to necessarily uh, think about. But, you know, I think you're gonna bring that yourself anyways when you look at work. And Mark, um, Daniel also has a question for you. To what extent do the digital tools used in your process leave traces in the finished work? Um, I think for my my digital works onto the traces it leaves. I think digital works are very there into in the work. I think my works with textile emphasize my digital work, I would say. So it's still there. It's a matter I'm very comfortable with the printing or if the color changes through the print, then if I like it, I'll keep it. If I don't, then I'll die over it or cut it up. I'm very open to the process. Yeah, I definitely feel that your textile and sewing um, adds to the collages that you're making. It feels like very rich when you have this final work that's hung on the wall, at least in my experience with the work that you have in the show. Thank you. Well, I wanna give you all um, some time to ask each other questions if you wanted to touch on anything anyone talked about tonight before we close out for the evening. Um, does anyone have anything? I had a question for Nabila actually with the work that's in the exhibition and um, other works that I've seen of yours. Um, there's a, a Besides using paint and, and sculptural elements, there's this relationship between images and photographs. 
um, specifically in the work above in the gallery upstairs. I mean, uh, there's uh, images of uh, pieces of toast or bread, and then there's the idiom. Uh, can you speak on that? Yeah, so um, I felt like for that work, it goes back to that like abstract visual language um, and like creating sort of symbols. Um, and in this piece, it was sort of talking like with the toast specifically, sort of talking about like the administration's, um, I guess the way that they were speaking about like Latin American culture as a whole and like talking about the people that were coming over and simplifying it in this weird, like stupid way. Um, sorry, I sound very angry, but I'm not, I'm kind of excited. But um, so I, I felt like, how can I kind of express that sort of stupidity and um, this sort of simplification of like nationality and race. And I thought that like bread was this like great way of sort of doing it. Um, and I feel like I have kind of opened up well, I come from like a super painterly painter background, like very traditional materials, like just oil paint. Do not put anything else because then you're sort of diminishing like the strength of painting. Um, but I feel like I've kind of opened up um, towards like other materials a lot more. I feel like um, like people like Howard, when I was doing that, like, oh, I need more like, um, women artist in my life, which is horrible um, to kind of think about. But when I was kind of doing that or researching that, I was looking at people like Howardina Pindell, and she was introducing like these little like dots, um, that hole punch dots that she would put in her paintings. And just like the rich richness for th when I saw that piece for the first time, the richness and like the texture and the different materials was like really exciting to me and then a lot of the like um uh i guess like work that had to deal with feminism a lot of them were using like materials that were associated with like craft that was this like female sort of thing so you have like fabric or like quilting or like glitter and sequins and i was like yes to all of that so i wanted to kind of put all of that in there in a way um, so I feel like now I'm just sort of more open to kind of having photography, having like, um, different materials. Plus, like I couldn't paint toast if someone like held a gun to my head. I just like, I am not that sort of painter. Um, I just can't do it. So I figured like the image of it would just be, um, better. I didn't need to. So I didn't need to prove my skills. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, that's that. <laughs> Hopefully that answered. I have one more question and I'm going to pose it to Laura as the curator. Um, if you would have known that COVID was going to take place and we would need to distance ourselves from each other, how would the show or the work have changed or adapted? I actually caught wind that COVID was taking place when I did my last studio visit with Philip. That was the same week that I we announced that we were going to be working from home. And it did influence the show. I also wrote about this show in the weeks that followed um, in isolation when we had to stay at home order. And I immediately turned to those idioms um, and also the word friendly. That I, I kept playing around in my mind with Philip's work friendly and our choice to print it really large and have that be the first uh, word that you see. And I know that I still struggle with this idea of smiling behind a mask and feeling fully expressed. And also um, I catch myself sometimes um, kind of falling back on my old way of, of thinking and, and and greeting people like I still want to like hold the door for people and and I still want to take off my mask or rip it off in an excited way and you know and use my hands to talk and I feel like I'm really limited so for me I started thinking about that phrase I started thinking about let sleeping dogs lie even I like that Nabila's working with that politically 
And we are in a culture that there are moments where we try to leave things as they are. And we try not to like push the envelope to bring in another idiom, you know, and, and I started thinking about these things in a playful way. And then I was also, you know, felt even more rewarded uh, when artists started to play as well with meanings, like with Adrian and Felice, how their work came together. You know, I also love what Nabila is saying about like using bread as a vehicle to discuss larger issues. And we're in this unique moment of not only being distanced, but I know Nabila was touching on it a little bit where the social and political issues that have been a problem for a long time are rising to the surface. And it's an, also a time for protests. We need to protest and we also need to stay safe. So there's this strange balancing act. And I, and I feel that this show is providing a balance as well and that the works all speak to each other. Uh, so the show was really directly impacted by COVID and then choosing to really put up the work anyway was really a brave thing for Ulight. You know, as, as a team, we made this decision and we communicated with the artists. And I think everyone was excited for the show to be up physically and for us to represent it in a way online so that we didn't just halt our programming or, you know, cut out an opportunity for artists that we keep trying to not only uh, maintain the opportunities that we currently have like, to keep our art artists in the studio to make the artists like their their studios available to them um, from you know 24 hours a day whenever they need to work um, and then also to create more opportunities and the relief fund and to really continue to just maintain that artists are really important to us culturally so that's a really good question and I'm was really happy that the show um, provided me and the artists with the ability to have good conversations and then to continue those conversations. Great, well, we're just about out of time. I wanna thank all the artists for sharing all this insight into your work and thank you everyone who joined us this evening. If you hadn't had a chance to check out the exhibition online, we can drop the link in the chat for you. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your week and we'll see you soon for our next program on August 12th. Art Sounds with Aaron Deal. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night.